Welcome back, my friends. In the previous session, we looked at seven similarities between Jesus and Joseph based on verses 1 to 4 of Genesis 37. Today, we will talk about a simple but very interesting nugget from verse 2. In verse 2, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. Now, we will look at the significance of the age of Joseph. 17. In Hebrew, 17 is pronounced as Shva Esre or Shva Asar, the most common pronunciation being Shva Esre. And while 17 can be thought of as 1 plus 16 or 2 plus 15 or 8 plus 9 and so on, it is always represented in all languages, including Hebrew and English, as 7 plus 10. Interestingly, 17 is the seventh prime number. Throughout the Bible, God often gives symbolic significance to very mundane items or concepts. For example, in Genesis 9 verses 12 to 16, God makes the rainbow the sign of his promise to Noah and by extension to all mankind that he will not judge the whole earth by flood waters again. God uses bread as a representation of his presence with his people in Numbers 4 or bread as a representation of the gift of eternal life in John 6 and of the broken body of Yeshua, the Messiah, sacrificed for our sins in Matthew 26. So the rainbow and the bread are obvious symbols in scripture, but less obvious meanings are attached to certain numbers in the Bible, especially the number 7, which at times provides a special emphasis in the text. These numbers appear in a certain regular pattern in the Bible, signaling the author of the Bible, signaling that this is God's pattern. For example, the number 7. The first use of the number 7 in the Bible relates to the creation week in Genesis 1. that God spends six days creating the heavens and the earth, then rests on the seventh day. So this is our template for the seven-day week observed around the world to this very day. The seventh day was to be set apart as the Sabbath, a day of rest. Thus, right at the start of the Bible, the number 7 is identified with something being finished or complete. So we see the command for animals to be at least seven days old before being used for sacrifice in Exodus 22, or the command for leprous Naaman to bathe in the Jordan River seven times to effect complete cleansing in 2 Kings chapter 5, and the command for Joshua to march around Jericho for seven days, and on the seventh day to make seven circuits and for seven priests to blow seven trumpets outside the city walls in Joshua 6. So in all these instances, seven signifies a completion of some kind, a divine mandate being fulfilled. Now if God's number is seven, then man's number is six. And six always falls short of seven, just like all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in Romans 3. And series of seven things crop up often in the Bible. For example, we find seven pairs of clean animals on the ark, Genesis 7. Seven stems on the tabernacle's lampstand, Exodus 25. Seven qualities of the Messiah in Isaiah 11, verse 2. Seven parables in Matthew 13. Seven woes in Matthew 23. So this multiples of seven also figure into the Bible narrative. The 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. According to Leviticus 25 verse 8, the year of Jubilee was to begin after the passing of every 49th year, that is 7 times 7. Jesus told Peter to forgive a wrongdoer 70 times 7 in Matthew 18. Now speaking of the book of Revelation, the number 7 is used there more than 50 times in a variety of contexts. There are 7 letters to 7 churches, 7 spirits before God's throne, seven golden lampstands, seven stars in Christ's right hand, seven seals of God's judgment, seven angels with seven trumpets, etc. In all likelihood, the number seven again represents completeness, totality. And the seven churches represent perhaps the completeness of the body of Christ. In all, the number seven is used in the Bible more than 700 times. And if we also count the words related to seven, terms such as sevenfold or seventy or seven hundred, etc., the count is still higher. Of course, not every instance of the number 7 in the Bible would carry a deeper significance. However, there are times when it seems that God is communicating the idea of 
divine completeness, perfection, wholeness by means of the number 7. What about the number 10? What does the number mean or represent in the Bible? The Ten Commandments. God gave us the Ten Commandments that were a reflection of His expectations of mankind and as a way to represent His holiness and that we could never fully achieve the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments are vertical towards God. The last six are horizontal, human relations. The Ten Commandments, if kept, would be all that the society would require to live in peace and harmony with both God and mankind. So the number 10 seems to reflect God's authority or God's governmental rule over the affairs of mankind. This is seen elsewhere as in the 10 elders that were placed in most of the city gates of Israel, for example in Ruth chapter 4. So the number 10 also seems to represent man's responsibility of obedience to God's law. So such a number seems to indicate the law, responsibility and completeness of order in both divine and human structures of society. Further, we also see that the beast in Revelation chapter 13, verse 17, etc., he has 10 toes, 10 diadems, 10 horns represented, 10 kings. So this number 10 keeps showing up in terms of some kind of a government. Also, the phrase God said appears 10 times in Genesis 1. And that is why the Jewish scholars believe that there are 10 dimensions in the world as we know it. I find it interesting also that humans who are created in the image of God, we have 10 fingers, 10 toes. Also, there were 10 plagues which are reflective of the completeness of God's judgment. Also, the Passover lamb was to be brought into the home or household on the 10th day of the first month, according to Exodus 12 which is symbolic of the true Passover lamb entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the 10th day of the month of Nisan. Also, Jesus was the atonement provided for the sinners and the day of atonement is on the 10th day of the 7th month. Further, there were exactly 10 generations that lived up to the flood of Noah's day. Noah was the 10th patriarch and after this generation, God's judgment fell on mankind. Also, the tithe is 10% being set apart for God. Jesus also used the number 10 in many of his sayings, particularly his parables. There were 10 virgins in Matthew 25, 10 lepers in Luke 17, 10 talents in Matthew 25, 10 minas in Luke 19. In conclusion, this gives us a better understanding about the number 10, how it represents in the Bible. However, we are looking at the combination of 7 and 10. So we have divine completion, Perfection, 7, and 10 being divine law or rule and order. What does 17 stand for? So let us look at the Bible references to this number. The first time that this number 17 occurs in the Bible is very significant. Genesis 7 verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So God chose to destroy the earth on the 17th day of the second month. But then, in Genesis 8 verse 4, Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. So on the 17th day, God prevailed over the sinners of the earth. The earth was restored. God returned the earth to perfection. Now I want to draw your attention to the day that the ark first touched ground again on Mount Ararat. And we read that after the waters had receded, the ark touched down on the mountains of Ararat on the 17th of the 7th month. Let's explore this a little more. If you think about it and study further, you'll find that the ark is a picture or a type of baptism. In going down through the waters and coming back out, it is a picture of death, burial, resurrection. Now with that in mind, it makes it extraordinary that the day that the ark touched the earth again is on the 17th day of the 7th month. The 17th day of the 7th month therefore is an indication of new beginnings, resurrection. You see, in Exodus 12 verse 1, the Lord changed the Israelites' calendar. 
Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying this month shall be your beginning of months it shall be the first month of the year to you Now in this chapter is when God instructs how to memorialize the Passover feast So what had been the seventh month since creation was now to become the first month And to this day the Jews have these two calendars usually known as the civil and the religious calendars And as you can see the first month on the civil calendar is the seventh month on the religious calendar which is our gregorian calendar around the months of september and october and also the seventh month on the civil calendar is the first month on the religious calendar the month of nisan march to april so the 17th of the seventh month when the ark came to rest and a new life dawned for noah and his household on the civil calendar is exactly the same day as the 17th of the first month called nisan in their religious calendar so what is significant about this day then there are a surprising number of key events in israel's history that occurred on this exact date the 17th of nisan for a start noah's ark comes through the waters rests on the earth for the first time beginning new life to noah and his family on the 17th of nisan second Moses recorded the fact that Israel crossed the Red Sea and physically left the land of Egypt on the 17th of Nisan. And this is given in Numbers 33 verses 1 to 8. The Israelites set out from Ramesses on the 15th day of the first month. They camped at Sukkoth, that is the 15th, they camped at Sukkoth. They left Sukkoth and camped at Etam 16th. And then they camped near Migdol 17th. They left Pihahiroth 17th and passed through the sea into the desert. Now we have to keep in mind that Israel's days start at sunset. So the Israelites crossed the Red Sea on the 17th of Nisan. Another Solomon's temple was cleansed and we see that immediately upon becoming king Hezekiah commenced a great religious reform. In 8 days they had reopened the great temple of Solomon, cleansed it of defilement as we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. and the cleansing of the temple was not completed until the 16th day of the first month nisan and so we read how early the next morning that is the 17th day of the first month king hezekiah gathered the city officials and they went up to the temple of the lord another very significant event takes place on the 17th of nisan we read in esther chapter 3 verse 12 on the 13th day of the first month a decree is passed Haman had convinced the king to sign a decree to destroy the Hebrews and the decree went out on the 13th of Nisan. Esther then proclaimed a fast in Esther 4 verse 16 and this fast was a 3 day fast. So for the 14th, 15th and 16th. And on the 3rd day, we know in Esther chapter 5, that is still the 16th, Esther then approached the king saying to herself, if I perish I perish, which is an attitude of death and willing to lay your life down. in God's hands also in Esther 6 we see that Mordecai was honored and queen Esther had called for a banquet dinner for king Xerxes and she had also invited Haman the enemy at these banquet dinners and we read in Esther chapter 7 at the second banquet dinner that is on the 17th the king accepts Esther's petition to spare my people kill the adversary Haman So on the 17th of Nisan the tables turned on the enemy Haman and instead of the Jews being destroyed his own life was taken so now I'm sure you'll agree that God has placed some key resurrection type events victory events on the 17th of Nisan now all of these were of course but a small picture of the greatest event that would occur on this day the resurrection of the most important person Yeshua the Messiah's resurrection Jesus entered Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan even as the Passover lamb would be brought to the household he brought himself to be sacrificed and with the death of Jesus on the 14th of Nisan the Passover all looked like it was lost to his disciples to his followers their messiah was dead the one that they had placed all their hope in was gone and yet we see that 3 days 3 nights later on the 17th of Nisan which was the feast of first fruits at that time that they were to offer to god the first fruits of the harvest and yet on that day jesus rose from the dead 
being the first fruits right so the son of man had resurrected on the 17th of nisan and also he was the first fruits on the feast of first fruits because first corinthians chapter 15 says christ is now risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep look at all these connections with the 17th day of the first month so like the defeat of the egyptians the death of haman on the same day as we've seen in the past or the dedication of the temple of solomon now this sunday morning saw the resurrection of jesus the defeat of satan death had been turned into life and defeat into victory so based on these verses the number 17 is connected with new beginnings with resurrection with complete victory over evil and overcoming the enemy there are some more interesting connections with this number 17 There are seventeen foes of Israel, ten of which will be vanquished in the future. Seven of them already vanquished in the past, and they're listed in Psalm eighty-three, verses six to eleven. And if you actually look at all these letters, which are in blue highlighted, and you count them, set of names are ten enemies yet to be vanquished, and the next seven were already destroyed in the past. So ten plus seven, seventeen. Also the Bible constantly talks about seven heads and 10 horns like in the book of Daniel or in the book of Revelation so it's not just about the ruling powers from Daniel's time to the second coming of Jesus but also the devil's end time system as given in Revelation 13 for example true Christians however will claim ultimate victory over God's adversaries when he resurrects them back to life and one of the major themes of the day of atonement yom kippur which occurs on the 7th hebrew month on the 10th day is the binding of satan revelation 20 thus 10 plus 7 equals to 17 which testifies to christ's perfect overcoming of satan the number 17 can also symbolize our standing with god for example in romans 8 verse 35 and then verses 38 to 39 you see all this what shall separate us from the love of god in christ and then all the highlighted letters or phrases tribulation distress persecution famine nakedness danger sword add up to 7 and yes death life angels rulers things present things to come powers height depth anything else in all creation add up to 10 so 7 plus 10 things that cannot pull us away from the love of god in christ yeshua all these enemies that we have nothing can separate us from the love of god and also when we look at the explanation of love in 1 corinthians 13 love is patient kind does not envy does not boast is not proud is not rude is not self seeking is not easily angered keeps no record of wrongs does not delight in evil rejoices with the truth always protects always trusts always hopes always perseveres love never fails there are 16 explanations to what love is and the 17th mention of the word love in that chapter comes when the apostle paul states these three remain faith hope and love but the greatest of these is love god's unending love is truly victorious over all things those who stay faithful to god to the end of their lives walking in love will gain the victory over the grave when they are miraculously brought back to life the resurrection which is mentioned in first corinthians chapter 15 so as we examine today the number 17 which is the age at which joseph's life is about to take a massive turn what will seem like utter defeat and loss will be transformed to eternal victory so let us remember all the connections of this number with new beginnings resurrection complete victory over evil overcoming the enemies until next time grace and peace be multiplied to us all